Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We invite uh, our witnesses to come and to sit uh, behind their name uh, tags at the panel. And, uh, uh, and uh, at 4.25 on Friday afternoon, uh, I just want you to know that this is all part of our plan to get rid of everybody so we could have the most important panel to ourselves with unlimited questioning uh, by uh, the chairman and by Ms. Baldwin. And, uh, and so the whole day, this has been the plan, just so we have this special panel uh, for that purpose. And to begin, uh, I am going to ask uh, Congresswoman uh, Baldwin to introduce our first witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to introduce a constituent whose expertise in conservation and climate change is well known and well documented. During her 17 years with the Nature Conservancy, Tia Nelson led that organization's climate change program, where she played a key role in developing forest protection and restoration as a climate change mitigation strategy. Tia received the EPA's Climate Change Leadership Award in the year 2000. Since 2004, Tia has served as Executive Secretary of the Wisconsin Board of Commissioners of Public Lands, and in 2007, Governor Jim Doyle appointed Tia as co-chair of the Governor's Task Force on Global Warming, a broad coalition of Wisconsin's experts and leaders that in 2008 produced a nearly unanimous report on the ways Wisconsin can be a leader in addressing the challenges presented by climate change reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, and advance the state's energy independence objectives. As the daughter of Wisconsin's great congressman, governor, and U.S. Senator Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, you can certainly say that Tia's dedication to preserving land and water resources is in her blood. She is carrying on her father's great environmental legacy and forcefully creating her own. He would be justly proud to see her with us today. Tia. Thank you so much for your very kind introduction. I'm quite grateful. I'm uh, proud to be represented by you um, in Congress and grateful, too, for your environmental leadership. Thank you, Chairman Markey, for your endurance this week. Um, I'm grateful to be here today. Um, in the interest of conservation and efficiency, I plan on trying to be very brief and talk very fast. Um, I am here to share with you a little bit about Wisconsin's experience. Uh, uh, Governor Doyle, who's been a leader on the issue of climate change, uh, appointed a task force which I co-chaired uh, with my distinguished um, colleague uh, Roy Thilly from WPPI Energy. And Roy and I co-chaired a group of uh, uh, 29 uh, stakeholders representing industry, um, uh, tribes, environmentalists, manufacturers, uh, labor interests, uh, agricultural interests, um, uh, uh, citizens, and uh, we reached year, near unanimous um, uh, consensus on our report, which, which Tammy just held up for you. The governor tasked us with uh, three objectives. Number one was to identify short and long-term targets for emissions reductions. Number two was to present policy recommendations to achieve these goals. Number three was to identify opportunities to address climate change while growing Wisconsin's economy and creating jobs. We worked for a year. We produced a report, as I said, near unanimous support. That report has many similarities to your bill, Mr. Chairman. The renewable uh, energy and the efficiency titles are quite similar. The renewable portfolio standard, the low carbon fuel standard, the energy efficiency language, the building codes, the lighting standards, and a few others um, are remarkably similar to our report. Um, these are the measures that are most cost effective, as you know, and uh, we in our process identified them similarly. So uh, first and foremost, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to applaud you. The uh, committee draft offers real solutions to address climate change, promote energy independence, and modernize our energy infrastructure. And I support the draft you've put forward and believe if we work together, um, it will work for Wisconsin and uh, for the nation. Um, 
the biggest challenge for us is working on cost containment. Wisconsin, um, as uh, progressive and long of an environmental tradition as we have, uh, Wisconsin is um, heavily reliant on coal. Um, about 70 percent of our energy comes from coal. We're the third largest manufacturer in the United States. This uh, means that cap and trade poses some real cost challenges for us, but we believe that we can work with you on those costs. Um, the draft does not propose an allowance structure, and I'm not here to support a particular approach, but I thought it would be valuable to share with you what we did in the task force, because what we did in the task force ended up uniting this diverse group of stakeholders uh, to support a bill that has strong emission reduction targets. They're almost identical to yours, a little tougher um, in the midterm and a little weaker in the long term, but effectively about the same. We have tough targets. Um, we have uh, tripling conservation and efficiency, increasing renewables two and a half fold, um, and uh, it's quite uh, an endorsing a cap and trade, not a state cap and trade, but a federal cap and trade. Um, the biggest issue for us to discuss was how to do cost containment as a heavy coal dependent state. We came up with an idea that I haven't heard yet um, that I hope you will seriously uh, consider. The discussion to date has been about 100 percent, has been about uh, uh, allocation issue and whether to auction all allowances or uh, allocate them for free. Um, these are the two extremes. What we did was come up with a compromise. That compromise united the group. That compromise suggested that up to 90 percent of the allowances in the early years, maybe for a period as long as 10 years, up to 90 percent would be allocated, but not for free, it would be allocated at a small fee. And that you would increase the uh, auction percentage and decrease the allocated at a fee percentage over time over, uh, to give us time to transition our economy, in essence. That fee structure gives you cost certainty, gives you cost containment, it creates a, uh, a predictable revenue stream which you can then draw on to help low-income uh, folks uh, do energy efficiency, do investments in climate research, and so on. So that's how we got at the issue of cost abatement. Uh, for a state like Wisconsin, offsets will also uh, be important. We have a very important f uh, forest and farm um, uh, industries, um, and we believe that uh, uh, changes in land use practices can help mitigate uh, uh, climate change. I was thrilled to see in your bill that you included offsets both international and domestic and recognized uh, the role of uh, forestry. Um, many people don't know that deforestation is more than 20 percent of annual greenhouse gas emissions globally. And um, as a matter of fact, those emissions exceed the emissions from all of the planes, trains and automobiles in the world. You cannot address climate change without addressing the issue of deforestation and assisting developing countries in finding alternatives to destroying not only their forests and emitting greenhouse gases, but uh, other environmental um, uh, benefits of the forest. So uh, those are the two most important issues for us in terms of cost containment. We want to embrace um, uh, most strongly uh, your draft bill and discuss with you ways to help make it work for Wisconsin. We're grateful for your leadership and, uh, um, and I thank you. Thank you. In the same way that we had uh, Mr. Ruth uh, earlier, the Nelsons are, of course, are environmental aristocracy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I think everyone is feeling good to be on this panel with you uh, uh, here on the 39th anniversary and hopefully by the 40th anniversary of Earth Day. Yes, next we will, year. We will next have year. resolved all of these issues. You bet. I'm going to hold you to then. Um, well, uh, I think. I think we can do it, but um, um, it, it's, as you can see from the earlier uh, <clears throat> preliminary rounds uh, that we had here, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, contentious, but I think ultimately achievable. Well, you have a big challenge, but I want you to know that Wisconsin's keen to work with you on, on overcoming some of those challenges. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, our next witness is Bill Becker, Executive Director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies. Um, he served as the first executive director of the State and Territorial Air Pollution Program Administrators and the Association of Local Air Pollution Control Officers. So 
Uh, whenever you're comfortable, Mr. Becker, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Congresswoman Baldwin. My name is Bill Becker. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies. We are an association of air pollution control agencies in 53 states and territories and more than 165 major metropolitan areas across the country. And undoubtedly, every single one of them is watching uh, this hearing through the Internet today and into the evening. Uh, Chairman Markey, uh, our association applauds you and Chairman Waxman and your staffs for not only the incredible amount of hard work that went into drafting this proposal, but for your leadership and the level of commitment being put forth for moving this legislation so quickly and yet so thoughtfully. By carefully balancing the vast array of diverse interests, you have found a center point around which consensus can ultimately be achieved. You have put the prospect of success on this critical issue, which for so long has been so elusive, within reach. And taken together, the core components of this bill comprise a solid foundation for a realistic and federal climate program. We are particularly pleased that you have included a mandatory economy-wide greenhouse gas reduction strategy with quantifiable and enforceable limits and significant mid, near mid and long term reduction targets, generally strong language protecting the rights of states and localities to exercise leadership in responding to global warming, performance standards for stationary sources of greenhouse gases, a renewable electricity standard, a low carbon fuel standard, requirements for cleaner, more efficient transportation, provisions for adapting to global warming, and many others. Is this precisely the bill that our association would have written had we held the pen? No, not exactly. But we fully understand the perspective from which you crafted this legislation and toward that end have developed a set of recommendations that we believe are consistent with that perspective and can be incorporated into the bill without upsetting the balance you worked so hard to achieve. Our written testimony details each of our recommendations and I, what I'd like to do is spend a couple of minutes highlighting three of them. First, we agree with the emissions reduction targets in the bill that they're significant and that they're part of a compromise, part of the U.S. CAP proposal. At issue, however, is whether they are sufficient to avert dangerous anthropogenic warming. Since the last IPCC report was released in early 2007, scientific developments have shown that global warming is proceeding more quickly and with greater impacts than previously thought. Accordingly, we urge that you consider strengthening the reduction targets or at the very least ensure that these targets not be weakened as the bill moves through Congress. Second, while we support the offset integrity provisions in the discussion draft, which are designed to ensure that any offset credit represents permanent, enforceable, additional, and verifiable emissions reductions, we are concerned about the generous offset credit pool, which would allow capped sources to use up to two billion offset credits each year to meet their compliance obligations. When capped sources purchase offset credits, rather than reduce their own greenhouse gas emissions, this dilutes the effectiveness of the cap. And finally, we are pleased that the bill would amend the existing Clean Air Act Savings Clause to make clear that states and localities have the authority to enact various important measures and strategies. I'm sorry Congressman Upton isn't here for this because um, we think it's very clear in the bill that you've preserved not only California's ability to retain its own greenhouse gas standards for motor vehicles, but you have not tampered with the authority in the Clean Air Act under Section 177 for other states to opt into California's program. We are troubled by the provision in your bill that would preempt state and local governments from 2012 through 2017 from implementing or enforcing their own caps, thereby compelling the dissolution of regional cap and trade programs such as REGI, the Midwestern Accord, and the Western Climate Initiative, as well as California's program. We recognize this program, this provision, excuse me, may be intended to create a breather during which the federal cap and trade program would be the only one in existence. Nonetheless, this would rev revoke an important state and local authority. Moreover, we fear that if the bill is weakened as it moves through the legislative process, yet this timeout remains, 
states would be required to surrender their successful programs and revenue in exchange for an inferior federal program. Instead, these state and regional path-breaking programs should be provided the option to decide whether the federal program is rigorous enough and the choice to transition into the federal program. So in conclusion, okay. in conclusion, a successful national climate protection program must be predicated on a strong local state federal partnership. In order for our nation to meet our greenhouse gas targets, we must ensure that all levels of government are fully engaged in the design and implementation of this program. We look forward to working with the committee as it moves through Congress and to President Obama's desk for signature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Becker, very much. Our next witness <clears throat> is Carl Royal, a member of the Securities and Futures Regulation Practice Group of Schiff Hardin LLP. He has over 30 years of experience in the regulation of markets and uh, market participants under the Federal Securities and Commodities Laws, uh, and he has spent 14 years at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange serving as Senior Vice President and General <coughs> Counsel. And on a day when we heard Ken Lay's name mentioned uh, again, uh, Mr. Royal can perhaps give us good instruction as to how to construct this marketplace uh, in a way that will protect it against fraud and manipulation. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you move the microphone in a little bit closer? Thank you. Um, I recognize that this uh, bill and this committee's uh, jurisdiction is covering a very wide territory, as the various other speakers have, have already covered. I'm going to focus on a very narrow aspect of that, and that is uh, the trading part of cap and trade and, and how that market should be, should be regulated. I think there are two basic themes that are of critical importance here. First is just recognizing that it is very important to have a well-regulated market to avoid some of the abuses that we've seen in other markets. Uh, in this market in particular, because it has such a, uh, an impact over so many sectors of the economy and is going to be of great importance to users of uh, emissions and the general public, so I do believe that it's essential that the regulatory framework to be created by Congress protect the integrity of the market and ensure that the market achieve its environmental purpose. It therefore should meet the following objectives. It should be designed to be as transparent as possible. Participants in the market should be protected from manipulation and fraud. And the market should resist the development of speculative bubbles that divert prices away from the fundamental drivers of supply and demand. Because this market is one that's being created de novo, this gives Congress an opportunity to create a market that can avoid some of the problems we've seen in other markets. In my view, if we can provide the, a regulatory framework that combines an exchange trading requirement, strict limitations on traders such as position limits and margin requirements, and tough enforcement provisions, it then would be possible to achieve uh, protection of the public in those areas. I recognize that there have been other markets in recent months where there have been some serious problems credit default swaps, for example. But I would point out that that was a market that uh, exists in the unregulated over-the-counter market and is not necessarily a problem with the instruments, but perhaps in the market and how it was uh, not re regulated effectively. If you move a market to an exchange environment, I think you can avoid many of those problems. I think first that exchange trading maximizes market transparency because all parties in the market, as well as the federal regulators, have access to pricing information in real time and can see what other traders are doing. Second, exchange-traded products have standardized terms that make them easy to understand and easy to price. That improves market liquidity, which helps keep the cost of trading low. Third, exchange trading comes with clearing by a central clearinghouse, acting as central counterparty to all transactions. Under center, central counterparty clearing, all positions are valued every day based on market prices as determined by a neutral party. If a position's value goes down, there is a daily call for cash called variation margin. This financial discipline would have prevented many of the problems that are now being faced by banks and other participants holding mortgage-backed securities and other forms of OTC derivatives that are worth much less than the banks are valuing them 
on their balance sheets. Uh, further details on some regulatory suggestions are contained in my written remarks, and I thank the committee for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Royal, uh, very much. Uh, next uh, witness, John Anda, is a visiting fellow of the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. Mr. Anda was pre pre uh, previously president of the Environmental Markets Network at the Environmental Defense Fund. He has worked uh, to create a framework for the U.S. carbon market that is fair, efficient, and responsive to lessons learned in the financial crisis. And that's very important because we have many people who are saying, well, how can we create a new market here? Uh, and is, won't that be dangerous? You know, mentioning Bernie Madoff or mentioning Ken Lay or mentioning credit default swaps or other uh, machinations of the marketplace that have occurred. Um, the truth is that uh, what Bernie Madoff did was illegal. And there were clues, actually, to track him down 10 years ago that just were not followed up on. And in credit default swaps, there were many warnings over the years, as well as there are in many of these other areas that ultimately came to hurt confidence in the marketplace. But at the same time, uh, we are not going to ban the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and say trading just can't occur because that would bring capitalism to its knees. And so that's why we have Mr. Royal and Mr. Anda here today, to help us to frame the way in which we can create a marketplace that will work, be transparent, honest, uh, and if manipulation does occur, uh, lead to um, uh, the apprehension of and ultimate imprisonment of uh, someone who abuses the system. So we welcome you, Mr. Anda, and whenever you are ready, please begin. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we obviously have a risk with creating a new financial market for carbon, but we also have a great opportunity. Carbon actually could set a standard that could be used in other markets, and Carl referred to that, and I certainly uh, support that point. Um, let me just get right down to some comments about the work the committee has done. I think you did two things really right in, in establishing fairness, efficiency, but also taking some lessons from the recent financial crisis. The first one was in allowances. The discussion draft says, sets a best execution standard for allowances. That means that anyone who buys an allowance is assured of getting the best price available in the market. That's something we do in our equity markets under something called the national market system, and that was a great thing for the committee to do. Secondly, the committee made a very important decision in derivatives. In derivatives, the discussion draft says that derivatives will basically be traded on listed regulated markets, the kind that Carl described, rather than in the OTC market, which is very common for commodities. And sometimes people put carbon in the commodities um, world. I think those were, were bold decisions and set, set the right tone for the bill. So I, I'll talk maybe a little bit more about those later, but I want to add some context to these decisions. And I know it's late on a Friday afternoon, but I think just a few numbers are instructive. Over the life of the bill, you're going to be issuing 131 billion allowances. But initially, we might have as little as $5 billion outstanding if we just do an auction for one year. So in the financial world, we call this a really small float. $131 billion over the life or five, and five years out in the first year. Now, another way to think about that is that you're telling emitters that they have to abate carbon over 38 years, but if they want to manage that risk, they only have one year of allowances worth to trade to manage their risk. So what will that lead to? That's going to lead to huge demand for derivatives, um, absolutely huge demand. And I don't think that's a problem. I just think it's a good idea if you're going to have huge demand for derivatives, recognize it and have those derivatives traded um, transparently and in a way that the system doesn't um, get out of control. As an aside, I would encourage you to think about increasing the float. You can do that as you've already provided in the discussion draft. You can auction an extra four years' worth up front. But if you, th if you think about using that provision, if you did it, you'd, you'd have maybe 25 billion tons to auction in the first five years. If that was $20 a ton, you'd be hosting a half a trillion dollar auction. That's a little too big. 
Um, so that's a tough way to do it. But to the extent that you do have free allocations, either for all of the topics you've talked about the last few days, leakage or uh, giving them to LDCs, do it up front so that we have more allowances and a less derivatives dependent market. Lastly, I'd encourage you to think about something like rights. The government uh, auctions rights to emitters to buy allowances in, say, five years' time at a fixed price, say $20. That would be a way of sort of pre-selling the rights and providing some financing to emitters. And clearly I won't discuss that late on a Friday afternoon in my five minutes. Um, let me just go back to the best execution point and make one little comment. I love the national market system. In my 20 years at Morgan Stanley, I came mostly out of the equity business, and, I, and we certainly, um, our, ben, our markets have benefited from that rule. But carbon isn't, you know, thousands of stocks. It's, it's basically one instrument. And I, I think certainly one option for the allowance market would be to have a central marketplace, one electronic, what I call a clob for carbon, a central limit order book where all the trades occur, everybody can see the bids and offers. I think that's something that might be a good idea and might even be embraced by the market participants. Um, in the derivatives area, I just want to make one important comment. What goes hand in hand with requiring listed exchange trading of derivatives? You've got to have rational accounting so that emitters can use these instruments. So if an emitter, uh, one of your local utilities, wants to buy a future and their intention is to exercise that future in a few years and turn it in for compliance, don't make them market to market. It's just they're just locking in an expense and deferring it. If you do mark to market, one of the main reasons people do OTC, highly structured derivatives, is to avoid mark to market. So get the accounting right. US CAP mentions rational accounting in their blueprint. And I think what we want to do, we want these derivative markets to be kind of like farmers use derivatives all the time. It's part of their normal course of business, and I hope it can be for emitters too. So um, just to conclude, I think I apologize for this being a bit technical, but if, if you want to go a little further, you can read my written testimony, um, and also included in my testimony as an appendix is a primer on carbon markets that we at the Nicholas Institute wrote just a couple months ago, and it gives a lot of background on this um, important topic. But again, I congratulate the committee on setting the tone for a fair and efficient U.S. carbon market that does take lessons from the financial crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ander, very much. Uh, just for your information, the, the regulation of the securities marketplace was uh, proposed here in this committee until the year 2000 uh, when uh, the uh, Republican majority moved it over to the banking committee. And so I was the chairman of the uh, subcommittee with jurisdiction over the financial marketplace. So I find this a fascinatingly exciting subject that uh, you are talking about. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I would only note to you that uh, in two 1994, the last year I was chairman, um, I had introduced a bill to regulate derivatives. Alan Greenspan sat where you are sitting. Uh, and his testimony was that counterparties have a stake in the stability of the system, so we did not need uh, any kind of regulatory system in, uh, in the derivatives marketplace. I think we have now learned that uh, derivatives in and of themselves are not good or bad, but unregulated uh, derivatives in a non-transparent marketplace is like uh, a hydrogen bomb aimed at the economy. And so by learning these lessons, putting in place a well-structured regulatory marketplace, I think we have a chance to incorporate each one of these instruments in a rational uh, financial system. Uh, our next witness, David Doninger, is the policy director of, of, the, of NRDC's Climate Center. Mr. Doninger uh, works on policies to cut global warming pollution from power plants, motor vehicles, and other major industries, and leads NRDC's work to complete the phase-out of chemicals that deplete the Earth's protective ozone labor, uh, layer. David also served for eight years in the Clinton administration where he was director of climate policy uh, at the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we welcome you here, sir. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to focus uh, today on the relationship between your new bill and the current Clean Air Act. 
The, the Supreme Court found in Massachusetts versus EPA that EPA already has the authority and responsibility to control carbon dioxide and other heat trapping pollutants under the Clean Air Act. NRDC salutes Administrator Lisa Jackson and the Obama administration for issuing the endangerment determination a week ago, officially recognizing what she called the compelling and overwhelming evidence that global warming is dangerous to our health and well-being. We can take a big bite out of global warming pollution using the Clean Air Act we have today. But we cannot do all that is needed under the current law. We need the legislation before this committee to cap and cut carbon emissions, to raise energy efficiency and renewable efficiency, energy standards, and to rebuild the economy and create millions of new jobs on a foundation of clean energy. The ACES bill wisely proposes to keep and, in most instances, strengthen uh, provisions of the current Clean Air Act. Despite the Supreme Court decision, there are some who claim that no part of the existing law should ever be used because if EPA ever starts using the Clean Air Act to address big sources like cars and power plants, it will not be able to stop itself from regulating every donut shop and barbecue in the land. But EPA has the tools to focus on the big sources, not the tiny ones. Donut lovers and barbecue fans can sleep soundly at night. NRDC supports the ACES provisions reforming, uh, reaffirming the Clean Air Act authority to set performance standards for vehicles. We support the goal of, of coordinating the Clean Air Act and CAFE standards and setting new ones that meet or exceed California's pioneering levels. This is a plan that retains California's critical leadership while also giving the auto industry the benefits of practical national uniformity. For power plants and uh, major industries, EPA also has authority under Section 111 of the current Clean Air Act. Indeed, Administrator Jackson is required to act soon on power plants. In another case, a companion case to the Massachusetts case, the ACES bill tailors the current Clean Air Act provisions for power plants. We support those provisions. The bill does contain a number of proposed exemptions from the Clean Air Act. Two of the changes NRDC believes make sense. That is, not to regulate greenhouse gases under the ambient standards for hazardous air pollutant programs. We support the bill's provisions to set new source standards for sources outside the cap, but we disagree with exempting sources covered by the cap from those same new source standards. And we also disagree with the complete elimination of the case-by-case -case new source review for large, new, and expanded carbon emission sources to meet the donut shop concern, it's sufficient to limit new source review to sources of, say, more than 10,000 tons of CO2 equivalent. Let me say a word about the role of the states. During the long period of federal abdication, states have led the way. And if the federal program should come off the rails at some future point, it's critical that states be able to pick up the slack once again. States have capabilities to curb emissions and deliver energy efficiency and renewable energy that the federal government can't match. And for these reasons, NRDC strongly supports the many provisions of the ACES bill that would harness state capabilities and protect their role. There is one very troubling exception, though, a six-year suspension of state authority to implement or enforce cap-and-trade type programs. NRDC doesn't believe a real case has been made for why any such suspension is needed. We have suggested in the written testimony a possible way forward uh, that uh, would um, uh, keep states in the game and keep a strong state program. One last word about equal access to justice. The ACES bill expresses a, an entirely common sense intent that persons with either environmental or economic injuries should have equal access to the courts when compliance, when EPA's compliance with the new law is in question. These provisions are fair and balanced, and they should be retained. So I have covered carbon market regulation issues in my written testimony. I'd be happy to comment on those, too, in, in Q&A. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Dunger. 
Our next witness, uh, Patricia Mulroy, is the general manager of the Las Vegas Valley Water District and Southern Nevada Water Authority. Ms. Mulroy oversees the operations of the Las Vegas Water Valley Water District uh, and the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which is responsible for acquiring, treating, and delivering water to Southern Nevada. Uh, we welcome you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm also here today on behalf as a member of the Board of the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies and on the Board of the Water Research Foundation. And on behalf of, the, of America's water utilities, I want to congratulate you and thank you for your leadership on a bill that many of us have been awaiting anxiously for some time. While the primary focus of the bill is energy, water and energy are inextricably linked and must be considered together. The Department of Energy estimates that 4 percent of our country's energy is consumed by the treatment, transmission and delivery of water, while conversely the generation of energy consumes vast amount of water resources. We in the water utility business are on the front line of climate change, and for us it is happening right now. Water utilities are learning to adapt to this reality, and we have to if we are going to provide safe, reliable water supply to our nation. My experience reflects the challenges facing the American Southwest, where the flows of the Colorado River support nearly 30 million people and irrigate 15 percent of the nation's crops. During this decade, the seven states that share this river have witnessed cumulative flows drop 11.8 trillion gallons below average. If this drought continues, in three years Hoover Dam will cease generating electricity. Other regions are also beginning to see the effects, whether it is floods in the Midwest or groundwater um, aquifers beginning to see saltwater intrusion, and you know only too well the drought that has been ravaging the Southeast. My agency's first adaptation strategy was to adopt one of the nation's most aggressive water conservation programs, having paid our customers $110 million to remove grass and replace it with desert vegetation. This has resulted in reducing our water use by 22 billion gallons over the same time period where our population swelled by 400,000 inhabitants. We are also racing to build a new intake that goes deeper within Lake Mead. In California, officials are grappling with not only worsening Colorado River conditions, but a drought in the Sierra and restricted use of in-state supplies. My purpose today is not to induce alarm, but rather to convey the magnitude of the situation and offer a water industry perspective on adaptation strategies. One of our most immediate needs is research, not just more research, but more focused applied research. There are nearly two dozen climate change models, but none of them adequately predict effects on, water sh on a watershed-specific scale. The development of these strategies requires actionable research that explores the full range of impacts. To that end, we recommend that the Federal Government partner with the Water Research Foundation to optimize the value of, this re of these research investments. I encourage you to incorporate into your legislation the Climate Change Drinking Water Adaptation Research Act, which was sponsored last year by Representative Diana DeGette and Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid which provides funding for climate change related research from a small percentage of the cap and trade proceeds. This applied research will help provide information water managers need to make sound policy decisions. But even the best studied strategies won't work if they cannot be implemented. Climate change adaptation also means new water infrastructure. Our new Lake Mead intake will cost a billion dollars, and this is only one project in one community. Considering all the water agencies that will likely be affected, the financial implications are staggering. To help communities capitalize the necessary investments, we propose your legislation also include a concept similar to the proposed Green Bank for energy investments. A blue bank for water infrastructure would provide municipal water agencies the necessary capital to enact adaptation strategies utilizing a portion of the proceeds from a cap and trade system. Providing access to low-cost loans for climate change qualified projects would enable us to proactively adapt. To be clear, I feel strongly that water agencies should be financially self-sufficient. These funds would be subject to repayment by, me, by the water agencies 
which are historically among the country's most secure borrowers. Again, on behalf of the water industry, I would like to thank you very much for including us in this historic conversation and respectfully ask that you support our efforts to adapt and surmount the challenges of our changing climate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next uh, witness is Ann Smith, who is Vice President of Pract and Practice Leader of Climate and Sustainability for CRA International at CRA. Ms. Smith uh, specializes in environmental policy uh, and corporate compliance strategy. Before joining uh, CRA, Ms. Smith was a Vice President uh, at Decision Focus Incorporated, leaving, leading that company's uh, policy analysis. We welcome you here. Dr. Smith, whenever you are ready, please begin. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my testimony today is my own and does not represent my company, CRA, or any of its clients. Um, Let us be honest here. Reducing global greenhouse gas emissions may, uh, in order to actually substantially reduce the risks of climate change will be a costly undertaking, no matter how that it, it is done. Therefore, a successful emissions policy that is both credible and enduring is going to have to have a laser-like focus on cost minimization. The ACES bill lacks this focus right now. Even though it does contain a cap-and-trade program, which is often thought of as a cost-minimizing approach, uh, co achieving cost-effectiveness will be elusive with this bill uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, it is other non-market regulatory schemes, and second, uncertainty in the allowance prices in the cap-and-trade. First, the bill piles on excessive and redundant regulatory schemes on top of the cap and trade that reflect the command and control mentality of yesteryear, such as a renewable electricity standard, a low-carbon fuel standard, an energy efficiency, energy efficiency resource standard, and many more, including even a jacuzzi-specific standard that we have been hearing about today. These prescriptive provisions will undercut the transparency and predictability of the carbon prices under the cap and that will only increase the costs of meeting the greenhouse gas objectives or the target for greenhouse gases in the bill. To minimize costs, Congress needs to remove those mandates. But even without those redundant programs, the bill's cap and trade program has its own barriers to cost minimization, and this is allowance price uncertainty and volatility. These will hinder business planning and disrupt a, co a company's credit worthiness. The U.S. experience with SO2 and NOx caps tells us that emission prices will be very unstable. SO2 prices varied between $100 and $1,500 per ton in just the past four years, and that was despite a large bank of allowances. Europe's carbon cap has seen prices cycling up and down by a factor of four in the space of a few years. And despite assurances early on that Europe's carbon price volatility was only a feature of that cap's so-called learning phase, now we can see that those price swings are actually a feature of the cap's mature phase as well. In, in the EU, this carbon price uncertainty has inhibited companies from investing in the low-carbon technologies that are desired. And that same problem will occur under a U.S. cap that allows that same price uns uncertainty to occur here, too. Carbon price volatility introduces another concern that has not been discussed widely, credit risk. Companies will need to buy and hold allowances whose total value may be very large compared to their current cash flows and balance sheets. Allowance price variations can create cash flow crunches and balance sheet variations that in turn will translate into credit ratings uh, being reduced and increased difficulty in raising funding for new investments. The ACES bill has no provisions for, for providing the necessary price certainty and price stability to avoid these problems. Banking does not eliminate volatility. We have seen that in the U.S. and European experiences. Offsets do not either. The experience with the clean development mechanism says they may actually increase price uncertainty. And the bill's strategic reserve of allowances also does not. This, this provision would let prices vary by at least a factor of two before it would even come into effect and it doesn't ensure any actual price ceiling when the prices do spike. 
The bill needs to directly and transparently establish allowance price ceilings and price floors in order to remove these financial uncertainties, uh, which are only going to serve to exacerbate the policy's costs. Some fear that price ceilings will take away the certainty of adequate reductions in emissions. However, the, the, the certainty that's needed for emissions is their long-term reduction to nearly zero globally, not any specific reduction in a specific year in the U.S. Achieving that long-term zero emissions goal will require sustained investment over a very, very long period of time in utterly new directions. And this is more likely to happen under a policy that establishes a carbon price signal that's predictable and credible for decades to come. And finally, we need a full accounting of the cost of this bill. EPA's analysis of the cost of the cap doesn't consider the command and control aspects of the bill, nor the costs that are created by the allowance price uncertainty that we can expect. So it's misleading to present EPA's analysis as even a preliminary estimate of the impacts of this particular bill. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Smith. Our next witness is William Kovacs, the Vice President of Environment Technology and Regulatory Affairs for the United States Chamber of Commerce. In government service, Mr. Kovacs served as Vice Chairman and Chairman of the Commonwealth of Virginia's Hazardous Waste Facilities Siting Board and Chief Counsel and Staff Director of the House Subcommittee on Transportation and Commerce. Was that on this committee, sir? Yes, sir. And I'm really that old. And what years were those? <sighs> Uh, my staff's here. Uh, 1974, 75 through about 78. Yeah. So when I was here. Yes. Back then, long ago. Yeah. Brock Adams. Uh, so you Fred you were the chief counsel for Brock Adams. Uh, Fred Rooney. For Fred Rooney. Yeah. yeah. Great. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, well, thank you for inviting us here today. And I, and I have to tell you that when I was listening to you say you were, this is your 66th year of hearings and I'm your 60th witness, all I could sit there and say is what pressure. I've got to say something really quick and something he's never heard. So that's, that's quite a task. Um, l let me start off by saying uh, the Chamber really does support trying to find ways to reduce greenhouse gases. We've made that clear in all of our testimony. Uh, accelerate the use of energy efficiency and certainly find new ways to put green technologies into the marketplace. And with, with that, I just want to add a few suggestions because I think that they would really help move your bill forward. Uh, the first is, as you consider how you're going to do this, probably the one part that troubles us the most is you have very um, steep emission reductions over the course of the years, but there's really no assurance in the bill that as you force fossil fuels out of the system that there's a mechanism for bringing uh, substitute technologies into the system. And I say that because and I'm just going to use one example. Um, if you just take the 115,000 one megawatt windmills that you're going to need, that, that's going to take enough space that's literally going to equal uh, the, the going around the earth twice. And it's an enormous landmass. And the problem you're going to run into is not that, you, that price isn't going to drive technologies, but many times NIMBYs are going to drive technologies out. And one of the things we've done with this Project No Project is we've tried to identify the fact that in the last 18 months there have been 65 renewable facilities that have not been able to get to the marketplace because of NIMBYs and 13 grid systems. And we think long term that is a very serious problem. A second, uh, in terms of the Clean Air Act, we just think it's inappropriate and if you're going to set up a structure, you ought to set up a structure for carbon because it's going to be more workable. I think this, this idea of capping uh, the large businesses with cap and trade and then going into new source performance standards for the medium-sized businesses and then le leaving uh, it unclear and vague as to the small businesses. What you run the risk of with the small business is once an endangerment finding is made, there's going to be a lawsuit and you're going to have 26 million small businesses trapped in a new source performance standard. I don't even think the agency uh, uh, can handle that. Uh, in terms of uh, citizen suits, uh, this might even be the, this might be the most troubling. I mean, you really, uh, the, the cause of action has expanded so far. It's not just against government, but it's against government with some limited monetary damages. So that's the beginning of waiver of, of sovereign immunity. You remove the Article Three uh, type uh, actual case and controversy and actual harm for uh, the thought of harm, and, and long term that that is 
going to that's just going to be more citizen suits, more projects stopped. And and then when you have unlimited attorneys' fees, you're giving an incentive to the lawyers to, to bring these lawsuits. That's just not going to help you get the technology into the marketplace that you need. Um, and then finally, um, on the preemption of state laws, again, this just going back to where we were before, and that is. Uh, you, can't, you can't preempt it for five years and then let, then let the states act. If the federal government is going to do it, you need one comprehensive unified law that makes sense, that the in industry understands, so that we can start developing the technologies as opposed to trying to fragment it to please a lot of different interests. Anyway, uh, with that, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Kovacs, very much. Um, we will now recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin, for a round of questions. Thank you. Before I begin, I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record the testimony of uh, Thomas Gibson from the American Iron and Steel Institute on the bill. Good. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Tia, I, I appreciated your uh, testimony and telling us a little bit about the real diversity among the stakeholders on, the, on Governor Doyle's task force on global warming and the fact that you were able to reach near consensus on a uh, number of recommendations that you note are, are similar to the provisions contained in the draft discussion bill before us. We've also taken in this uh, committee testimony from representatives of U.S. CAP that had a similarly diverse array of, of stakeholders, um, and they were also able to reach uh, uh, substantial agreement around a, a blueprint for taking action on climate change. And I see similarities when I look across the, the Congress and this committee in terms of the diversity of interests and diversity of, of districts that we represent. So in many ways, we have a similar task immediately before us in trying to um, uh, gather support and, and gain a majority. I, while we'd love to have a u nearly unanimous vote in this committee on climate change legislation, I think we'll be um, uh, happy if we get a good majority vote on this. But I wonder if you can tell us about your year-long experience leading the Governor's Task Force on Global Warming with these diverse stakeholders, how they were able to come together to reach a set of goals and reduction targets that satisfied so many varied perspectives. And if you could tell us um, particularly what were some of the key issues that you had to surmount and the perhaps significant points of contention that you were able to overcome. Yes, uh, thank you for your uh, question. Um, Part of our success was I think we just fatigued everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we were at it for, uh, and I see that Chairman Markey is pursuing the same strategy, so <laughs> I, I wish him a lot of luck. Um, we met for, we originally set to meet for nine months. We met for well over a year, uh, and it was a difficult um, process. I think everyone came to the table in, in good faith, uh, which obviously helped quite a bit. Um, ultimately, uh, what we did, um, and uh, I give enormous credit to my co-chair for uh, this particular strategy, after listening to multiple stakeholders about multiple strategies, agreeing that we wanted strong targets, um, recognizing that we would need to um, uh, dramatically increase investments in conservation and efficiency and renewables to uh, meet those uh, uh, targets. Um, uh, and then realizing that we couldn't without a cap-and-trade program, um, uh, it became um, uh, clear to Roy and I that, that uh, we were going to have to put in front of the group, um, uh, in essence, a straw man proposal that uh, we hoped was delicately balancing um, the trade-offs between constituencies without compromising the environmental integrity of, of uh, our product, um, our report, which, which the governor accepted in its entirety, I, I um, uh, failed to mention before, uh, and which is going to be introduced to hopefully in the legislature. We're drafting it now in, in, uh, in the fall. Um, for uh, uh, industry, manufacturing, um, utilities, um, the cost containment issue was huge. So the way we kept them on board was a very frank, uh, you know, recognition that Wisconsin 
um, will have challenges in competitiveness as a uh, heavy coal dependent, heavy manufacturing. And our manufacturing sector tend to be more energy intensive. Right. We have to be extremely sensitive to global competitiveness. Um, um, and so by paying a lot of attention to the cost containment measure, we moved our RPS up, our existing RPS, and then, and then increased it two and a half fold, the same as, as, as in the uh, chairman's draft bill, 25 by 25. Um, so, um, really, the the compromise for the environmentalists, the the cap uh, in the integrity of the cap was essential, and for industry, it was essential to have uh, uh, to recognize that Wisconsin's in a very economically vulnerable position, being so heavily dependent on coal, and this allocation uh, proposal that we came up with. Um, that allows for a transition. This is just for a limited period of time that allows us to transition. Really, that allocation got us where we needed to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I will say that I have very limited knowledge on the market structure uh, discussion, uh, um, but I, I find it incredibly important on this. And so, Maybe you can help me understand it better. Uh, I'll start with Mr. Anda, and certainly Mr. Royal can comment on this. As I understand the futures market, you have hedgers and speculators. You have people who would want to um, possess uh, 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 futures on carbon uh, that um, might actually use them someday because they're emitters. And then you have those who just want to be a part of this market. Do we treat these two groups differently? Uh, do you propose that we do? And how do we, um, how do, especially with speculators, um, what sort of safeguards would you advise us to build into this um, market as we develop it? Well, I'll, I'll let Carl perhaps handle the point about speculators. But it's important that the market be open to all. The two points that I wanted to make are, number one, let's have that derivative trading in a place where we can see it, not over the counter, but on listed transparent exchanges, number one. And number two, mark-to-market -market accounting is fine for financial institutions and hedge funds. They, they, they do that anyway. But let's create something for the covered entities where they can you know, effectively uh, cover their carbon uh, risk using futures and options, because we might not give them many allowances to bank, um, let's let them use those instruments. And if their intention is to submit for compliance, let's have accounting for them that, in, in effect, is special, um, because they would treat this as a deferred expense, whereas a, a speculator would, uh, would, would mark to market. Just very briefly, um, you do need to have speculators in the market, otherwise called liquidity providers, because when somebody wants to buy, you need somebody on the other side to be the seller, or else you don't have a market. In terms of treating them differently, I, I think you can. I mean, for example, in the area of position limits, uh, an emitter uh, would need to have a, a larger quantity of allowances because you know it actually needs it for its for its business, whereas a, uh, a speculator uh, is is doing it just to provide liquidity for the market, and so wouldn't need to have such a large a large limit. And the I think the regulatory agency could, you know, establish different standards for those different types of market participants. Do you have any? early guidance on us on what, what sort of position limits we would be looking at? I, I, I don't know the market well enough to how it's going to develop to be able to answer that. I think that's probably an area that might be delegated to the agency that's in charge of the market. Okay. I, I would just comment that the exchanges today do a pretty good job of setting limits because their members don't want to create excessive risk within the exchange. So we where things get onto exchanges, you know, we, we things tend to uh, avoid blow-ups. When they're off exchange, that's a different story. My colleague, uh, Andy Stevenson, was in the same field as, uh, as these gentlemen. Uh, in our written testimony, we recommended 5% uh, position limits in the futures uh, uh, for any given vintage of a future delivery date, and with an adjustment that if uh, an, an emitter has the kind of need that Mr. Royal suggested, that they might be holding 5 percent above their own needs. But uh, a 5 percent seems to uh, be uh, an adequate amount in our judgment. Okay. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, let me turn to you, uh, Ms. Mulroy, and uh, I'm very intrigued by your blue bank idea. Um, 
I, hear, I had a testimony from the mayor of Philadelphia recently, uh, and he talked about the need for some way of dealing with his water supply problem and the protection of his uh, watershed. Could you tell me how, let's say, for Philadelphia's purposes, a blue bank might work to deal with those two problems? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not as familiar with Philadelphia as I am with New York, who share a similar concern to Philadelphia and actually are a member of the climate coalition that eight of us have formed in the United States. For them, the question is, increased flooding will contaminate reservoirs that today feed New York City that pre and do not require treatment. Mm -hmm. At some point in time, they are going to have to build treatment facilities, which will cost them billions of dollars for treating water they have never had to treat before, because as those flood flows increase, it will contaminate those reservoirs. So how would the Blue Bank then work for New York City? For the Blue Bank, let's say in the case of New York, would help them finance those treatment plants to protect New York City and be able to allow them to build them in a timely fashion and not sit through three years of a boil order in New York after the contamination has occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So um, just so I can understand a little bit about this concept that you have, does it have a coalition behind it or is this an idea that you have personally? No, there is a coalition of water agencies in the United States behind it. I think all of us, whether we are in Florida, whether we are in New York or whether on the West Coast, know that the way we have been managing water resources for the last 100 years is obsolete. And whether it is investments in helping our communities make changes, investments in conservation mm -hmm. that we can capitalize, or whether it is new facilities because our water supplies are either being contaminated or disappearing before our eyes, we know we are facing those challenges. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ander and Mr. Royal, let, let's take the European uh, uh, marketplace right now and, uh, and talk a little bit about how uh, the, the price of uh, a carbon credit has fluctuated between uh, $40 a euro Ooh. and 6 or $8 a euro. Is that a good thing, a bad thing, or that's the way the market works, and it's better than the government making decisions about where the price should be in differing economic circumstances. Mr. Royal. Um, yes, I, I, I mean, I'm not familiar with that exact market, but I think in general, I mean, markets do go up and down, and that's, that's one of their functions. I think in this context, it could even serve a useful purpose because it would be counter cyclical, because in times of uh, booming e economies, uh, you'd expect more demand for the allowances, and that would tend to increase prices at a time when it could be afforded, whereas in times like we are having now where industries are closing plants, uh, you would have a, a less need and less demand for the allowances, which would then tend to drive the price down. So in, in a way, having a market-based mechanism would be, would be self-correcting and would uh, you know, help smooth out some of these economic cycles. See, that is how I view markets, but you know, some people would say that is an indication of a market not working, but I would basically argue that that is a perfect example of the market working. Mr. Ander, can I, you come? I just think um, two things. Um, first of all, to highlight the point about the major factor in the market is the global economic um, recession. If you look in the EPA's recent work on evaluating your draft discussion, there was an interesting chart in there that showed that in 2006, our business as usual reference scenario for emissions in the U.S. was going to we were going to go from from six billion to over eight billion. The current numbers go from six billion to about six and a third billion. So think about the impact. Just we've really changed our assumptions about how much we're going to emit without policy. Well, those same factors have driven prices down in in Europe. Um, point number one. Point number two. Let's not forget that. The European market uh, ends on the last day of 2012. And so while allowances are bankable into the next period, we don't really know what the next period is going to be. So I, I don't think it's fair. The world emits, as you know, 30 billion tons of emissions from CO2. A little over 2 billion are covered in the European trading system. They were bold enough to, to start with a small market. When we come in, I think we'll have less volatility in a bigger market. Thank you. Mr. Doniger. If I may add two points to that in, in partial response also to Ann Smith's uh, comments about vol volatility. The $40 mark 
uh, was hit at a point in the early experiment with the uh, EU when, when they uh, received for the first time accurate information about uh, emission levels. In other words, they started their program without full information about how much was being emitted in the first place, and there was a systemic overestimate of how many emissions there were going to be, and people paid more for the allowances on the basis of that. When the data came in, there was an adjustment. This problem will not happen here because we already have much better data about actual emissions from the power sector, and thanks to the EPA's uh, proposal of a more comprehensive emissions inventory system, e e even in advance of your legislation, we are going to have much better information across the board when the program starts. The other thing is, as John was just mentioning, if a program comes to an end, then there is a, a possibility that the allowances become v valueless near the end. and That is the advantage of your sketching out a long-term uh, carbon uh, budget uh, with a declining cap. And uh, since there will be long-term continuity, there won't be that problem of, this, of the program coming to an end uh, or appearing to come to an end and people having the doubt about what the allowances are worth. There is very little likelihood of the European program coming to an end either. Um, so let me go to you, Mr. Kovac. Some of the members on the chamber board, Duke Energy, Alcoa, testified before this committee earlier this week. And while your board represents a broad coalition, it appears that many and possibly most of your members support a domestic policy that would set goals uh, and the means for reducing the overall levels of U.S. global warming pollution. How do you reconcile the Chamber's position with those of some of the firms that sit on the Chamber board who are testifying before our committee asking us to pass a cap-and-trade bill? I guess I, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess I thought you'd never ask. Uh, look, we, we, within our federation, we have uh, roughly about 3.5 million members, 3,000 trade associations, 3,000 state and local chambers, and 1,000 trade associations. That's an enormous difference. So when we analyze a bill like yours, for example, and it was an example I used today, let's just take, um, let's just take the application of uh, new source performance review. You have one group which is relatively small in numbers, 30, uh, that would, would sit there and literally be exempt from the new source performance review because of the caps. Then you would have a second tier of you know, thousands of members uh, that would be subject to it. And then you have the 26 million small businesses out there that in some way have no idea whether they are going to be subject or not but could be challenged. And every one would be hit by an attorney's fees. So what we try to do is we take the entire policy, we, we, we apply our principles to what it is you are trying to do, and we make a determination of whether or not uh, it meets those principles, which are does it does it harm the economy? Does it pr promote competitiveness? Does it accelerate technology? Uh, can we do, do we have enough energy in the environment? And, and will it? How is it going to affect the international structure? And that's how we do it. Is the chamber willing to come forward with proposals that tell us what they would be comfortable with as the regulatory scheme? I thought you never asked. We actually had a debate on this issue uh, today, three hours, uh, where we had the proponents of a carbon tax. Uh, the proponents of a cap and trade representing U.S. cap uh, in a third way, and we had uh, quite a spirited discussion. And, and you know, frankly, it was probably the most optimistic discussion I, I've had. I, I don't know that I'm free to tell you the results, uh, but there certainly was a lot of talk and a lot of uh, willingness to find out how it is we get reductions in a way that helps the economy. Okay, great. And uh, in your, your your statement that Congress should not mandate the use of technologies before they actually exist. Uh, we don't have any mandates for any specific technologies in the um, in the legislation. So I'm just wondering what you're referring to. Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, I mean, the, the, the probably the biggest issue that we care about is that we don't think you can get enough energy back in the system as a, to substitute for what you're going to take out. I'll give you an example: clean coal, the Bard facility in Ohio. Here was an example where they went through the DOE loan guarantee process. They literally got all of their permits. They were about to break ground, and then they were notified by several environmental groups that they were going to sue. DOE then decided that the risk of that lawsuit was so great they were going to pull the loan guarantees. And this is clean coal. 
And so what happened is the company walked away from the project. And if that was the only project, we probably wouldn't care. But we've right now looked, and, and we've only been doing this a month, we've got about 300. And uh, I mean, there are other, it's not just energy. Uh, the other day we had a presentation on cell towers and someone said, well, there are 800 of them on hold because of this. This is a big issue and we have to, we have to deal with it. And we got a lot of cooperation on the stimulus plan when we started uh, offering, how do we move this through? We wanted a time limit uh, and, and Senator Boxer and Senator Brasso finally came to an agreement that we would use the most expedited route. But this is an issue that I think, if you can solve and, and start making us feel like we're gonna have real energy in this country and it's not gonna get stopped, you're gonna then find uh, that some of our major concerns are really starting to be addressed. Again, we're not mandating any particular technology um, in the legislation. Although, but I would, I would say this to you in terms of uh, kind of an extension of the optimistic meeting which you had uh, today. Um, were you in two places at once or um, how did that work today for you? Uh, that was from 8.30 to 12. Uh -huh. um, I'm not c closing in on the number of years of hearings that you've had. But no, no, I'm, I'm just saying is you, I, I, I thought that you might be you know, ubiquitous and omniscient, you know what I mean, kind of like, you know, like super, you know, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the, um, in 2008, um, there were about 9,500 new megawatts of natural gas capacity installed in the United States. Uh, there was about 1,500 new megawatts of coal installed in the United States. But the really good, the really, I think, uh, kind of O. Henry ending to this is that um, while there was no new nuclear, there hasn't been for 15 years and there won't be for another 10 years uh, because it takes that long to build a new plant, there were 8,500 new megawatts of wind installed in the United States in 2008, um, 400 new megawatts of solar, uh, 150 new megawatts of geothermal and 100 new megawatts of biomass. So that's 9,000, more than 9,000 new megawatts from renewables. In other words, 45 percent of all new installed capacity in the United States in 2008 were renewables. Uh, and, and, and that's before we pass a national renewable electricity standard. That's before we build in incentives for a low carbon uh, economy. So. Um, so while we're not mandating any specific new technology, it's obvious that the technologies are there and would be improved as the economies of scale kicked in as the market grew larger and larger over the years. So I'm a little bit perhaps uh, more of an optimist because of my own experience with the 1996 Telecommunications Act, uh, which I introduced in 1993. Uh, before this committee. Uh, after it finally passed in 1996, um, uh, we went from a point where not one home in America had broadband in 1996, not one home, to a point where 10 years later there's a whole new vocabulary. YouTube, Google, eBay, Amazon, Hulu, thousands of companies, millions of new jobs. They didn't exist, of course, because the market wasn't there before 1996 for broadband. It was all narrowband. Huh? So here we're talking about the same kind of a situation where there was an equivalent copper wire that we just had to move to digital. We had to move to broadband. We had to move to fiber optic. Well, here we have another copper wire for electricity in America. And it really hasn't been improved upon and I agree with the chairman when he says, you know, we might go back like 70 or 80 years. And the truth is that Thomas Alva Edison would recognize our electricity grid if he came back today. Um, we need a revolution. Um, but I think that, uh, that the, um, uh, the, 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 the problem that I have with the chamber is that the chamber opposed the Telecom Act of 1996. Okay, and it was basically making the same arguments, you know, it was making the same arguments about how, you know, basically how do you move from a black rotary dial phone to a, a world where everyone's got devices in their pockets and you have all these new, you know, companies that are going to be created. 
And so you're right, it does take a little bit of a leap, but a leap based upon our own American experience with technology and the entrepreneurial spirit. So my hope is that the meeting that you had today you know, will lead to a more optimistic view about what the private sector can do when a new marketplace is created and unleash the opportunities for thousands of companies um, that will be created, that will create a whole new vocabulary 10 years from now when people look back at this antiquated energy system, which we have. And by the way, I would include in that a carbon, cap, a, 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 a carbon capture a system that probably won't look anything like anyone is talking about today uh, and probably involve enzymes and, uh, and uh, acetic acids that are, you know, that are uh, reformulating just the way in which coal is burned and turning it into a positive product. Huh? But we've got to get on with that business, Mr. Kovacs, and I really urge the Chamber to you know, re just look back at its own history, especially with the Telecommunications Act and opposing that. that uh, Do you want me to respond to the telecom no, please, issue? Yeah. Or I'm, I'm, the yes, yeah, yeah, please. Uh, but on the telecom issue, my, uh, first of all, I wasn't there, but my recollection is, uh, especially as it had gone into broadband, is, is that they didn't want regulation on it because the, the wire system as being a regulated system was drying up and they needed a non-regulated system to put in the $150 billion in investment. Here in this act, well, all I'm trying to say is you, you have got a structure here which layers uh, uh, caps, cap and trade, and, and then you, in two capacities, then you have regulations, then you have litigation. What I'm saying is, is that I don't know that that structure will work. And the fact that you've got 8,500 uh, new megawatts of wind capacity, that's wonderful. We, uh, what we're saying is you, to get to the 10 percent, you need 115,000. That's a long leap, and it's a lot of land mass, and it's a lot but, of litigation. Can I say this? It's, it's really not a big leap. If you just take us from now to 2025, and you add just, well, it's, it's actually nine total, and just go nine times 15 years or 16 years, we've got the number. That's if we don't do any, any better between now and 2025. We just keep the pace that we are at right now before we pass a national law, right? Nine times huh? 16. So uh, all I'm saying to you, Mr. Kovacs, is that's it's just such a it's such a rearview mirror view of what technology can accomplish. You know, if we look out the windshield towards the future, just using 2008 as the metric, we wind up doing it, creating the jobs here, uh, and just revolutionizing uh, our our nation's relationship with imported oil and with greenhouse gases. Um, so that's really all I'm, I, you know, I, in a lot of ways, you know, we do need the Chamber of Commerce to look at this and to look at it optimistically and to realize that the benefits will flow right across the whole society. And I'll just give you one other example, and I won't hold you beyond that. I'm going to ask each one of you to give us the 30 seconds you want us to re remember about your testimony. But here, and I was the chairman, we moved over 200 megahertz of spectrum in 1993. Why did we do that? We took it from the Defense Department, we gave it over to the Department of Commerce because there were only two cell phone companies in the United States. They were both analog, they were both charging 50 cents a minute. They both projected relatively limited American use of cell phones. Obviously at 50 cents a minute, there weren't a lot of people going to be carrying that around in their pocket, huh? So what we did was we moved over the spectrum, but said for the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth license in every marketplace from Philadelphia to Las Vegas, they couldn't be owned by the first two companies. Well, guess what the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth companies did? They went digital. By 95, their price was under 10 cents a minute. And the first two companies, guess what? They both had to go digital. And they were both under 10 cents a minute. And then it was a race on to see, can we put pictures on that phone? Can we put data on that phone? Can we have a, a huge basket of minutes? And here we are today, all walking around with everyone in this room with one or two devices in their pocket, none of it possible before that. So I guess what I'm saying to you, and really what I would say to everybody who's interested in this issue, is that with just a little bit of optimism, not looking at some rocket science of putting a man on the moon, but just what's already happening in America. If we gave the right boost to it, uh, we could have this revolution just so far exceed uh, anything that uh, uh, we're even talking about today. 
That's what happened in the telecommunications sector, both, both uh, wireless and wireline. And I think if we give people a chance uh, in a new marketplace that the same thing will happen, Mr. Kovacs. So that's my message, and I just hope that it's received in the Darwinian, paranoia-inducing, market-oriented uh, way that we're going to try to construct this bill uh, and uh, put in the right market uh, protections, transparency, anti-fraud, anti-manipulation, and then just step back the way we did after 1996, and we don't know who the winners and losers are going to be. We don't know if there's going to be a 9X or a Bell Atlantic or a Southern or a Bell South. All we know is that the companies that win will be the ones that adapt quickly, and that's how it should be in our country, really Darwinian. And, uh, and in a lot of ways, I hate to say it, that's what we're talking about for our planet, too. You know, it's a, it's a real challenge for us in this Darwinian moment uh, that we can adapt, that we can put in place the incentives that make people rich while we're also protecting the planet. So we'll come back to you, Ms. Nelson, and we will give you a, uh, an opportunity for 30 seconds to tell us what it is that you want us to re remember. Thank you, sir. Uh, you deserve the endurance prize. Uh, I am grateful uh, for your interest. Uh, my message is simple. Um, uh, help states like Wisconsin um, uh, mitigate costs uh, without compromising the integrity of the emission reduction goal, and we'll be your partner in finding a climate change solution. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Thank Mr. You. Becker. Thank you. I have uh, three points to make. Uh, the first is that um, you and Congressman Waxman and others who worked in this bill should be very proud of your efforts. It's a very good bill. Second point is, um, as you know full well, this was a compromise, and yet this will probably be the high water mark uh, before this gets signed into law. It's going to undergo significant change, and it's going to get weaker. And the third point is, in light of that, um, it's very important that you strengthen the federal, state, local partnership and preserve the rights of states and localities to not only fill whatever gaps exist, but to be able to address emerging problems in the future. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Mr. Royal. I'll be very brief. Uh, in a cap Could you move market, in closer to the microphone, please? In a cap and trade market, it's essential that Congress create a regulatory framework that protects the integrity of the market and ensures that the market achieve its environmental purpose. Thank you, Mr. Royal. Mr. Anda. Three technical comments and one other. Um, increase the initial float. Think about a central marketplace to get your best execution requirement, the CLOB for carbon I talked about, and make sure that emitters can use the exchange-traded derivatives that you want to create. Lastly, I'd just say I heard a lot of testimony today. Chairman Markey, I hope that you're in a position, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Gore was this morning, um, to be a witness. Your comments are great. I think they should be. I'd like to see them expanded in a nice uh, half-hour, hour format, and uh, good luck to you and your work. Thank you, Mr. Ander, very much. Mr. Doniger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What this committee is doing is writing the next generation of the Clean Air Act. And we have the existing Clean Air Act and what you're doing. Uh, the, we need them both, and we need these things to merge, and it can be done in a way that makes for an effective carbon control program and an integrated system that takes advantage of the best of the clean air laws that we have already. Thank, Thank you. you. Sir. Ms. Mulroy. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we in the water industry, many of us have been anxiously awaiting this day where we in this country take this issue of climate change head on and begin to make the necessary changes. For us, because it's a decadal issue, we will feel the impacts, and we are looking for assistance for research, which is so desperately needed to um, quantify that those implications and in making the necessary adapt adaptations that we have to make. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Smith. Uh, two points. First, get back to cost minimization by stripping out the prescriptive and redundant measures so that that market-based approach can uh, work in its Darwinian glory, and by incorporating features that provide price predictability so that you can unleash those investments. Second, I'd like to correct the record. Um, the uh, prices in the EU did go up in the range of uh, $40 a ton twice once uh, during the early phase and second time just about a year ago. So it's not just a phenomenon of the learning phase. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Smith. And Ms. Mr. Kovacs, you have the final word of our, our historic hearings. Well, thank you for your good humor, if nothing else. Um, just wanted to say the success of broadband was really due a lot to what you did, and, but also you didn't regulate it. And I think that that's something we need. Not saying we shouldn't have a regulatory system here, but if you're going to do it, it needs to be transparent, understandable. You need to avoid overlapping and confusing regulatory structures between the Clean Air Act and whatever it is you're going to do. You need to find some way to limit litigation so we can get the projects moving. And I think at the end, you need to appreciate the fact that if we're really going to reduce GHGs in the atmosphere, we have to have some way in which to engage the international community. And we would suggest that the way to do that is an international treaty. Thank you, Mr. Kovacs, very, very much. The paradox of telecommunications regulation and regulation here is that you actually need new regulations in order to undo all of the old regulations to protected industries against change. And that's the paradox. That is, in order to create a truly competitive marketplace that just doesn't play into the needs of the largest utilities, whether they be telephone, cable, or electric utilities, because all of the laws have been written on their behalf at the state and federal level for 100 years, you actually have to create a whole new set of laws, of regulations, that ensure that the smaller distributed competitors can then begin to deploy their technologies. That's the paradox. But ultimately, you wind up with many, many more, thousands of additional competitors in trying to provide information services, or here, they will be energy and efficiency services for our country. And so that's kind of the paradox here. And while it seems as though we're regulating, uh, uh, what we're really doing is undoing the regulatory protection that was given to these industries uh, for 100 years, uh, while, the, while the assumption of monopoly on the wires uh, was taken for granted, when in fact, it's just the opposite if you change the regulatory dynamic. So that's what we're trying to do in this uh, legislation. We've already done it in telecommunications. We've done it in cable. Um, and this is the final wire going into the home. This is the, the final set of issues that we have to deal with across the board. And if we do it, then we can get out of the way because people's interest in becoming millionaires and billionaires will completely trump anything that we can do because they'll be out turning uh, green into gold all across our country uh, with their new technologies and their deployment. Uh, this has been a historic set of hearings. Uh, we thank all of you for your participation, and please stay close to us over the next month or so. We're going to need your uh, ongoing advice. Thank you. hours of nonfiction books and authors every weekend on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. Saturday morning, this year's Pulitzer Prize